Hello, welcome to this video. This is the penultimate video in this series. We're looking at the conflict poems from the OCR anthology Towards a World Unknown. If you've stuck with it, if you've come all the way through from the first poem, A Poison Tree, all the way to this poem, then you're nearly there. Um, and thank you very much for tuning in and getting your notes done. So what can we say about this poem? Well, I've looked into the uh, cultural and contextual details about this poem, and you'll have to forgive me if I get some of the details slightly wrong. I've tried to do a bit of research on it, um, but it's very confusing and it's very difficult for sort of like an outsider like me to get a good sense of the culture um, that's been discussed here and to some extent criticised. Um, so I'll, I'll try my best, but if I make a mistake at any point, please just forgive me, um, but also get in touch. You know, this has to be a mutual thing as well. Um, so yeah, offer me some constructive criticism if you find that I um, have said something inaccurate. Well, let's go down and have a look at the poet. Imitaz Darker, she is a very contemporary poet, obviously still alive and working, writing. She's an artist, she's a writer, she's released many books, and um, she has a lot of things to say about culture. And um, we need to start by looking at a bit, a few biograph biographical details about her, starting with the fact that she was born in um, Lahore, which is in Pakistan. Again, if I've said that wrong, I'm sorry, um, but I'll try and get my uh, pronunciation as, as accurate as I can. This is going to be an important place and we're going to have a little think about it in a second. She didn't live in Pakistan for very long, though. She moved to the UK and lived in Glasgow, Glasgow um, specifically, um, until she graduated from university in this country, at which point she then moved to India. So she splits her time between Mumbai and London at the moment. So this is where she kind of lives. And this is almost sort of like a metaphor for this um, poet, this woman, Imitaz Darko, because she refuses to be defined by these preset geographical terms. And we're going to think about that in a second in terms of identity and in terms of how people define you. There's a really important quotation that we should get down now in our books because she has said about herself, this is a quote from her, that she doesn't want to be defined by terms of location or religion. So I don't define myself in terms of location, so geographical location or religion. So it's hard to get across a, a sort of a real accurate sense of what, what how this woman sort of pictures herself in terms of religion, whether she's an atheist or whether she is religious. We know that being born in Pakistan and having a Pakistani family and an upbringing, that she has ties to um, the Islamic religion, whether she has shaken that off completely in this poem or just aspects of that is unclear. Um, but I would say that she probably still does um, tend to have some kind of faith um, but not in the sort of um, strict sense of sticking to this religion and all the trappings and all the laws that it inflicts on people. So she also says um, God has been hijacked. Now, this is a good word because it seems to suggest that it's um, the God, the God of Islam, the God of the Quran has somehow been misused and has somehow been um, used by people who want to try and justify um, violence. And this is what she goes on to say. God has been hijacked to justify uh, all kinds of violence. And this is not obviously just something that is exclusive to um, the God that she's talking about here. She's talking about religion in general. So God has been hijacked to justify violence. This is not just talking about war, but it could be. This is talking about domestic violence as well. So we've done a lot about war 
Now we're going to look at some kind of domestic conflict that happens between families who disagree on their version of religion. So these are the, the things that you need to keep in mind when you're reading this poem. It's all about identity. It's all about religion. And then it's about this idea of religion being misused to justify um, violence, both in war and in more specifically in domestic realm. OK, so I think that's all we're going to say about this. Uh, this woman we will find out some more as we go along. Now, it's what's really important is to understand the, the trigger, the inspiration behind this story. So this is based on a real event in history that you can look up in modern history. I believe that in 1999, um, this was the year right at the end of the 20th century, and there was a an honor killing of um, Samia Samia Sarwar. Okay, so in 1999, Samia uh, Sarwar, just getting the spelling correct here, was killed. She was murdered in Pakistan in Lahore. Remember, this is where um, Intel Darker was born. So she's going to be kind of interested in this and, and, you know, she's well informed by the time 1999 rolls along. She's she's getting used to um, working out these ideas of national identity, politics um, for herself. So she's interested in this story because Samia Sarwar um, um, was murdered in an office building in Lahore. And you can go on Wikipedia and you can um, read all about it and find out for yourself what happened here. But basically, the killing was not um, was not condemned. by Pakistan, by the country. Um, so in this country, if someone is murdered, it's the state's duty as the Ministry of Justice to investigate that murder and bring the perpetrator to justice. But the killing was not investigated. It was not condemned by Pakistan. And this is what gets her thinking about this idea of honour killing, because actually the, it was classed as An honor killing, and you can read the um, you can read the background to this story, and you can read about why why was this not condemned? Surely there's nothing honorable about killing people. The background basically is that she wanted a divorce from her husband. She left her husband, ran away with another man. And in retaliation against that, because it had brought shame on her family, her parents sanctioned an assassin to go into an office building that she was using to have a conference with her lawyers um, up in Lahore. And she and, and her mother met with her, brought along a man who shot her at point blank range. And this was to... Um, obviously restore some kind of honour to the family um, because they felt that, that she brought shame on the family. So it's this idea of like preserving um, family honour. So this is really central to this poem. And I'm not sure really, when I started looking into this, I'm not sure whether this is um, still the law in Pakistan or whether it's changed. I know that it's a central part of um, Sharia law that if the family doesn't wish to bring um, charges against the assassin then that honour killing is not investigated and so obviously here because the family um, sanctioned the murder they're not going to seek um, retribution for the killer so they were able just basically to get away with it and this is it started a whole series of protests um, and I believe the law has changed now but I, I don't know I, do, I wasn't able to find that out for sure so she takes the idea of an honour killing 
We'll make some notes over here now. We've got space. So she takes this idea of honor killing. I'm just going to abbreviate to HK. And she takes it as a metaphor. It's an extended metaphor throughout this poem um, to represent killing, almost like a metaphorical killing of her former life, of her former self. So she goes through this almost symbolic killing of herself, taking away all of her old um, cultural li life um, as, as part of being a Pakistani woman. Um, she strips them all away one by one. And this is almost like this symbolic killing of her former self. OK, so keep that metaphor in mind as we're looking through this poem. Now, what can we say um, about the form of this poem? So it's in irregular verses. And we can have a little think about what this, you know, why she's written it like this and how what that symbolises about what she's trying to say. It's mostly in blank verse, although there are some rhymes and half rhymes. That's interesting. Um, but usually, no, there's, they're, they're just kind of, you know, they're just sort of mostly, it doesn't rhyme at all. So it's mostly irregular verses, some rhymes, but not, not very many. And she uses these self-contained stanzas to um, express her views on this idea of seeking some kind of national identity, her own identity politics. So what kind of conflict is in this poem? Well, she's looking at the conflict between individualism versus state responsibility. You know, who is she responsible to? Is she is responsible to herself as an individual or is she responsible to her family's country? Um, she, there's also a lot of conflict within families. So we were thinking about the domestic um, violence here. So we're talking about this lady, Samia Sarwar, um, really important um, moment for Darker is just thinking about what you know who was she responsible to her family her religion her country the law or is she responsible for herself and her living her own sort of authentic life we would call it now and um, so it talks about those issues as well and basically the poem is just like one long metaphor where she starts to detail and list the things that she is stripping away from her former life and that's what stanzas one, two, three, and four deal with. They all start in the same way as well. I'm taking off these or I'm taking off this. And then we get this volta, this turning point in the poem. Now, if you haven't done much about this before, we can see that this volta, this turning point, is heralded, it's kind of signposted by a new way of beginning these stanzas. So she gets to the turning point just before the end, and we have these final two verses where she starts to think, okay, what am I going to do now that I've stripped away a lot of my old life? What am I going to do with my new life? So that's basically what the poem is about. She strips away her old life and she makes plans for her new life as the new authentic person that she is. A couple of things then that we need to um, go through in terms of vocab. Um, down here, I think this is the only thing that I could think of that would be like a difficult um word or term to to work out so I had to look this up I didn't know this but apparently this is a necklace given by the husband to a wife or a bride at their wedding okay so you 
you know, put this necklace around the person, you pr produce this necklace and present it to your wife. And that's Mangal Sutra is supposed to be the thing that you, uh, that represents that you belong together, that you, your husband and wife. Okay, so this is one of the things that she describes taking off to regain some kind of individual identity again. So let's look at the poem. Let's read it all the way through. And then we're going to just have a little bit of very shallow analysis today. Honour killing. At last, I'm taking off this coat, this black coat of a country that I swore for years was mine, that I wore more out of habit than design. Born wearing it, I believed I had no choice. I'm taking off this veil, this black veil of a faith that made me faithless to myself, that tied my mouth, gave my God a devil's face and muffled my own voice. I'm taking off these silks, these lacy things that feed dictator dreams, the mangle sutra and the rings rattling in a tin cup of needs that beggared me. I'm taking off this skin and then the face, the flesh, the womb. Let's see what I am in here when I squeeze past the easy cage of bone. Let's see what I am out, out here, making, crafting, plotting at my new geography. So if we go back up to the top, we'll see very simply that there are repetitive devices in this poem designed to create an effect. Let's firstly identify what they are. I'm taking off this. I'm taking off this. Okay, see how these verses have this anaphoric start. I'm taking off. And then because she's talking about a plural, we've got a slight change. I'm taking off these. And then again, the final time we see this is I'm taking off this skin. So we have then almost like a catalogue of ways that she's going to strip away at the old restraints of her life, of her religion, of her culture, of her country. Um, and all of these things seem to be tied up together, but she deals with them one by one. So in stanza one, she seems to take off the country. We've got the uh, metaphor here of the coat. It's a black coat of a country. Um, so we'll have a little think about this metaphor and how effective that is. She thought it was hers. She swore it was hers. And she, but actually, if she's thinking that this coat, the idea of belonging to this country, which we assume is Pakistan, she didn't really think it was hers, but she wore it because it was just a habit. It was something that she did, you know, born wearing it. This is my this is where I was born. So this is why we can kind of tie this idea of a country to Pakistan, because we know from the contextual details, that's where she was born. And I suppose if you wake up every day and you're wearing something and you wear it every day out of habit, you never really question whether it's yours, whether it's authentic to you. You just do it out of habit and design. Born wearing it, I had no choice. Interestingly here that she rhymes mine. I think it's the only time we've got a rhyme in this poem with design. And I think this is almost to create, it's the only rhyme I think in the poem, if I'm wrong about that, sorry, correct me in the comments, but it's almost to create this sense of rhythm, sense of momentum. And mine design, they seem to go together. And so perhaps she's saying that she's been tricked into thinking that it is her identity. She's kind of put this coat on, this coat of a country for years and years. I swore for years was mine. I wore more out of habit than design. These two things seem to go together. But as she examines it, she finds that actually it's not her identity. It's the identity of her parents. Born wearing it, I believed I had no choice. So we get to the end of this sentence here. And the stanzas 
are self-contained line end stopped the, the lines finish with this um a full stop at the end so sorry i'll move that over the stanza is self-contained end stopped and it's almost like she's finished doing this taking off the country she's dealt with this already So about the foot she's off and she does that by using this idea of a veil again it's a black veil of a faith she thinks the veil whether that is um, a burqa or, or some kind of other veil um, she feels like this represents it's a metaphor to represent the faith of um, Islam And again, it's something that she feels is not authentic to her, she, something that she can take off and feel that she is more herself. The black veil of a faith that made me faithless. Nice that we've got this parallelism at the end of the line here. We've got the antithesis of faith and faithless. So get these techniques identified because they are important in terms of her message in this poem. But she's not faithless. She's not. She leaves it quite ambiguous here. She doesn't take off the veil and say, that's it, I'm done with religion. I am an atheist now. She feels that by wearing the faith, she is almost, um, she's almost kind of denying herself denying her own um, authenticity. Okay, it's not part of her identity. So she's been faithless, but not to her God, to herself, because she feels that she's been muffled. She feels that she's been constrained. And so here we've got this semantic field of restriction coming in. She feels that the faith has restricted her freedoms um, by gagging her almost, that tied my mouth, gave my God a devil's face and muffled my own violence. Again, the antithesis here working really well. We expect God to have an angelic face, but actually she's saying that she's experienced um, the opposite here. So the antithesis working well to show that um, the faith that she's supposed to have is actually in opposition to her true identity. So I hope this is making sense as we go through this poem. Again, I think it's pretty straightforward in terms of the techniques that we're seeing here. This anaphora keeps going down into verse three. I'm taking off these silks. Now, in this, um, in this, we've looked at the, the country that she's taking off. We've looked at the faith that she's taking off. In verse three, we get the sense that she's taking off marital um, restrictions as well. And here, I almost get the feeling that she's kind of ch channeling Samir's voice here she didn't want to be married to her husband she went through this taking off of the marital restrictions that she put herself under by being married so i i, I just imagine these things as being things that um, a, a bride would wear in her wedding but again it's things that are that have this sinister undertone they seem really feminine, silks, lacy things, rings, necklaces. But actually, um, she's saying, she, and she seems quite critical here, that fee dictated dreams. Again, getting the idea that I, you know, I, I'm sort of, this is quite unsettling for me um, because I don't really, um, I don't really think, how, how could just wearing a dress and getting given a necklace when you get married, feed dictator dreams. Well, she's talking here, obviously, about this patriarchy um, that she has identified as being very prominent in that country. And it made it's made even worse through the 
um, idea here that when you're married, you're kind of, you're so reliant on your husband that you seem to be impoverished. She is not really talking, I don't think, about financial impoverishment here. I think she's more talking about her rights are being stripped away from her. She's impoverished. She's denied her own rights. So she's not financially poor, but she is poor in terms of the benefits that freedom can bring. Because if you're shackled to somebody, as she seems to say that she is here, um, then you don't have, you don't enjoy that freedom. And finally, I'm taking off this skin and then the face, the flesh, the womb. And I think this is a really interesting last stanza. And I think if I was going to learn any stanza out of this um, poem, this would be the one I would take off. Because here, especially this word, the womb, it seems to relate to her trying to degender herself. And maybe she's not saying, you know, I'm not saying at all that this poem is, is sort of about um, experience of a, of, a, of a trans woman. It's definitely not about removing womb and becoming a male or anything like that. But I think it's more like stripping away um, the expectation that um, being female demands of you. So the expectation to have a pretty face, the expectation of, um, you know, your flesh as being almost like a sexual um, image and also the expectation to create children. I think she's selected these three features of the female form really specifically there to reveal something that she feels restricted by in terms of her feminine state, the face, the flesh, the womb. And we can look at this lovely um, tripling uh, and also asyndetic listing of these body parts here. Um, and it's, it's almost kind of dehumanizing her in a way. It's taking away from the person. It's just looking at her in terms of the three aspects of being a female that she's trying to take off. I'm taking off this skin and then the face, the flesh, the womb. And I think we've got this asyndetic listing to really build momentum. And you kind of, this is right before the Volta, remember, this is right before this turning point in the poem. And you get to this point when you think, right, what is left of this woman after she's taken off all of these things? She's taken off the country that she felt a part of for so long. She's taken off a faith that she's also felt a part of. She's taking off marital restrictions. And then finally, she's taking off the constraints of her own gender. And I think you're supposed to feel this breathless sense of, of pace right before you get to this volta here. Okay, so pace is really important to this poem. And then we get this volta. So what is left of this woman? And she says, let's see what I am in here when I squeeze past the easy cage of bone. And I wrestled with this metaphor for a while because of course it seems on a literal sense to be saying, you know, a rib cage. The only cage that I can think of that's made of bone is your rib cage. But I think there's more going on with this um, metaphor. I think that she's probably using the images of restriction, maybe incarceration, to talk about being trapped, to, be to talk about being kind of imprisoned. There's this idea of imprisonment here from this message, from this metaphor, sorry, the cage of bones. So when she gets past the easy cage of bones, what does she find? So inside, what is she? And outside, what is she to the world? Okay, so these are the final two things that she's trying to describe in this poem of honour killing. And I think that you have to look at this and you think, right, well, what is her? She's still got 
all the same physical aspects as she had before. And it's easy for her. It's so easy for her to look past herself. Her own physicality. I think that word easy really gives it away here because actually she's asking the question and this leads into a nice message of this poem. What was holding her back all along? What was it? You know, what was the thing that was actually holding her back? Because when she squeezes past the easy cage of bone, what is she left with when she's stripped away, when she's killed off all the other aspects of her personality and her character and her identity? What is she actually left with? And she kind of answers it in the last stanza. Let's see what I am out here, making, crafting, plotting at my new geography. She finds a place in the world. And I think as humans, that's all we kind of, that's all we, we want, really. We want our place in the world. We want to search for that place, that meaning, that uh, belonging, that sense of belonging. And she does find this place at the end. We don't know whether this is a ge geographical, physical location or whether it's something that's more spiritual, more symbolic. But I think there's, there's a couple of important things to say at the end here. She uses this triplet of present participles. Now, present participles, they're active verbs. The sense that she now has something to do. Now that she's stripped everything away, she finds more fulfillment. So it leads to this idea of fulfillment. So we could say that. She also seems to be holding the power over her future. And she is, you know, she's a well-respected, um, she's a well-respected um, contemporary poet that definitely does seem to hold the power over her future. She's making the point here that she couldn't have got to this point of being creative, of being a crafting person, of designing her new future, if she hadn't stripped away those trappings of her heritage before this point. But when I start thinking about tenses in this poem, it gets me thinking about something a little bit more clever that's going on here. Because actually, it would make sense, you know, Verse one, two, three, and four is all kind of dealing with the things that she's had to do in the past to be able to break free. And then we could say if we were kind of lazy and we didn't really care about saying anything that's too perceptive, well, after the Volta, we have these present tense while she's thinking about the future. So obviously we've got this break here. We look at the past, verses one to four, and then we look at the future, verses five and six. But I really don't think that it is that simple because as we can see throughout the poem, I am taking off this coat. I am taking off this veil. I am taking off these silks. This does not read like she's done it once and she never has to do it again. Because these present participles are made all the way through, We get the sense that the journey she is on to finding identity. Is never really over. It's not really something that you just do once and then you never have to do it again. So almost like she has to take off a physical veil. And that's done once and she never puts it on again. 
But in order to keep redressing the figurative faith that she keeps taking off again and again, she has to do it more than one times, more, more than one time. Do we see that working here in this poem? And so I think what she's pulling out here in this poem very cleverly is the fact that she, although it might seem like she's finished with the veil, she's finished with the coat, she's finished with the marriage wear, and she's finished with her feminine expectations, she has to make that decision probably every day to take off these things again and again and again. And I think that's the point, that's the clever part of this poem. And it's reinforced by this very quick, you know, you could very, very easily ignore this little adverb at the start here. Look at this adverb, and it sneaks in so well at the start. At last, I'm taking off this coat. It seems to be at the end of one journey, but leads to the next you know journeys are never over are they they're never over they just lead to the next so we get this sense from the start that she's starting with this pivotal moment where she can take off the coat the veil the silks but actually she's reminding herself that she has to do it time and time again okay so that's a very um quick rundown of this poem on a killing i'm going to get down to the bottom here with some messages um, in a second and i wonder if you kind of identical bit with these images uh, addressing here even if you know you you know this is you find this quite offensive because you think well why is she talking about my religion like that i don't find it at all restrictive I don't find it at all oppressive. I think she's being much too critical here. You know, you could argue that for sure. But I think it's in terms of individual stepping out of that religion. I think that's how we have to see this poem um, presenting itself. So she obviously presents freedom um, coming from um emancipation from cultural religious or and even marital expectations expectation so she seems to be discussing this idea of freedom in her poem. But she also seems to be addressing the fact that past trappings haunt you. And they require you to um, retake off things that you feel you might have escaped. But I think, I think there is an overwhelming sense of hope and optimism at the end of this poem. And I think that the pace helps to build up this idea too. Okay, if I've said anything that's terrible or inaccurate that you disagree with, please drop me a note in the comments section below. But that's our look at the poem, Honour Killing. I hope you found it useful and um, I'll see you for the next video soon.